going to be 90 a week again. Right. And so, uh, while well, I was still cool, we were all right, and we were still our flag. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As you can tell, we have uh, a lot of fire protecting here today. So, you all stay here. Uh, we're going to get the program from the way it is we have. Uh, lots of people we have to, have to get on to give you important information. I'm going to start with uh, Arnie. Arnie. He's going to introduce our, our guest. Good morning, everyone. Um, just before we start, we're going to hand a sheet out to every row. And if you would please fill in your name, your community, and your phone number. It will help us update our records. We really need your help on this. So Karen is passing out a sheet at the edge of every row. It will be coming from the left and the right. Please do us a favor and fill it out. Thank you. We appreciate it. Let me announce all of our guests this morning and welcome everybody to this wonderful pre-holiday meeting. Please hold your applause till the end. Gabrielle Ferrer Ferrero, Civic, uh, Civic Engagement Liaison, Tax Collector's Office. Juanita Gomez, Representative Ber Schlossberg's Office. Mary Lou Berger, Commissioner, Palm Beach County, Ed Saul, Emily Schlossberg's Office. Terry Mitzi, Representative Tina Polsky's Office. Tony Keeler, Palm Beach County Fire Rescue. Dana Ackerman White, uh, County Mayor, Dave Kerner's Office. Chris Nordstrom, Senator Kevin Rader's office. Evelyn Duplisi, Senator Lori Berman's office. Fatou Benoit, Fire Safety Specialist, Palm Beach County Fire Rescue. Miguel Fernandez, Palm Beach County Fire Rescue. Chris Gardner, Palm Beach County Fire Rescue. Howie Zimmerman, Palm Beach County Property Appraiser's office. Harry Roush, Lake Worth Drainage District. Uh, Shea Beach, Business Manager, Palm Beach County Schools. Laura Corey, Regional Representative, South Florida Water Management District. Ed Chase, um, Intergovernment Affairs, Palm Beach County Government. Joaquin Almazor, um, Community Action Director, Sugar Labor League. Uh, Leslie Schreiber, Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. Jenny Caesar, Congresswoman Lois Frankel's Office. Thank you all for being here. Welcome. Thank you, Andy. That's a Take my papers. We're going to start off today with some good news. I'm going to ask the uh, Orchard New School, which the Alliance has been uh, helping with uh, finance and uh, volunteers for a number of years. And uh, the principals are here. I'm going to introduce her. This is uh, Lisa Lee. Uh, she's here for two reasons. One of them is uh, she's going to tell you a little bit that uh, good news that they went from a D school to a B school, and that's yeah. wonderful. She worked very hard, she did miracles there, and she's going to get a check. Come on up, there, There's a check. Big, 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 big. <laughs> Tell them to hear them going up, only going down. Thank you, Mr. Schoenbaum. First of all, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here at the Alliance meeting. I've come to a few meetings before in the last three years. This is my fourth year at Orchard View, and when I was asked to come to Orchard View, Orchard View was in a turnaround position. We were the only D school in Delray Beach, and the charge was to move, and move fast we did. We are a B school for the second year in a row, and we have been holding our own for the last four years. Thank you. It is because when I first came to Orchard View, the community came to me. Um, Harvey Arnold, Arnold came to me and introduced the Alliance to me and said that I should um, come here and meet the community, which I did. There have been multiple communities in Delray that have helped Orchard View become what we are. The funding that we get from the Alliance helps us with after-school tutorial programs, even snacks for our children who come to us with many challenges, 95% in poverty, 50% uh, uh, speakers of other languages, and 25% of children with disabilities. And so the extra funding 
that our school gets helps with all the little things that children need extra. And I can't even tell you what it goes beyond money is volunteering. Um, Harvey comes and does a stamp club after school, and those children love Harvey and love their stamps and love just talking to another human being that tells them stories. Um, we have various volunteers coming from um, different organizations and different uh, um, housing communities, such as where you live, that come in at a particular time to a classroom and help a teacher out for just a half an hour. This help and these relationships that children have with all of the people in our community make them value our community. I value you. I thank you. We couldn't have done this without you. And please keep the support coming. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Come back to and tell us your needs. Okay. We look, forward, we look forward to that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Moving right along, we're going to call him Captain Zant. Captain Zant, where are you? Yeah, we had some interesting information for us. <laughs> we always wanted to have you, Captain. Bring good news or bad news? Jury's out. Jury's out. <laughs> good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Me too. How was everybody's Thanksgiving? Good? Good. good. Yeah. I'm looking around the room to see if I can find at least one person that looks like they eat more than just me. <laughs> Winner. Winner. Well, listen, they, uh, obviously the holiday season is upon us. Yeah. It's supposed to be a joyous time of the year. And it will be. But like you've heard me say before, and last year on the holidays, it's the time also for the criminals to do what? Well, they have the shock too. Right? They have the shock too. So what I'd like for you guys to do is remember this. When you guys are at the shopping plazas and you're for holidays or even grocery shopping, it's very busy out there. So we got the traffic I want you to really pay attention to. We're uh, seeing a big uptick in crashes in the parking lots. And on top of that, we have a scammer on wheels now. All right? I pass I'm gonna I can't pass the flyers out, but Dr. Benicourt is gonna send it to everybody. I put some pictures here and some uh, flyers here on the table. But there is a silver impala that's driving around the parking lots. Anybody see the uh, the dent scam got pretty people? Has anybody been approached by the uh, vehicle that's driving through the parking lot no. with placards on and markers? No. That's a fix a dent. Oh, yeah. Have you seen it? Yeah. Folks, it's a scam. They're, we're getting a lot of reports that they're becoming very aggressive, too. So, what I want you all to do be polite, but be gone. Thank you very much. No thank you. Get in your car and leave. Do not entertain this. All right? We're not getting any reports back that they're associated with any violence or criminal behavior, but it's not good. It's a scam. All right? So, please do not do business with them. If they get uh, aggressive enough, I want you to call 911. Right? Report that you're being in a parking lot where you're at. Let us know what's going on, and we'll get somebody down there. Okay? More information is to follow. One other thing before I move on. I want you all to, to do this. When you're leaving the parking lot, I tell my wife this, I tell my family members this. When you're leaving a store, no matter what time of day it is or night, I want you, if you're a soul, if you're alone, wait for somebody to walk out with you. Even a stranger. I mean, you're not going to be holding your hand, but walk out with somebody because I tell you folks, there's predators in the parking lot that are waiting for an opportunity. They're just waiting for an opportunity. So be mindful, scan your parking lot, have your keys ready to go, and please, if you can, walk out with a crowd of people. Walk out with a group of people so you don't, you don't stand out. All right, make sense? Yes. All right. One other thing, uh, You'll also see uh, Irv Slopsberg's here today with his staff, and we're passing, he's passing out these flyers. There you go. So what, what these flyers are, that the new texting law that's going to be taking effect, let me rephrase that, it's in effect, we're going to be taking the law enforcement, of, uh, the law enforcement portion of it goes into effect January 1st. So we've been going through the last several months as an educational phase, we're moving on to the enforcement phase. So they were kind enough to pr pr produce flyers, produce these flyers, we're going to pass them around, and just so you know, they'll be going to every district in the county, and my officers, all the deputies are going to be putting, pushing them out on the street for civilians and, and for uh, vehicular, uh, for everybody that's going to be driving a car, really. All right, one last thing I have for you guys all today 
is I brought today Sergeant Yoda. Sergeant Yoda is in charge of uh, my motor unit for the South region. He also is oversees the commercial vehicle uh, section of the district. I remember telling you all the, the commercial vehicle unit we, 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 we enhanced on the South region, right? You guys remember that? They're dealing with all the commercial vehicles that we have, uh, the trucks, the problems we're having with us. So Sergeant Yoda today is going to give us an overview, an update on all the highlights of your ending. So with that, I want to wish everybody happy holidays, Merry Christmas, and have a safe and happy new year, and I'll see you next year. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. As uh, Captain said, said, uh, said, my name is Sergeant Scott Yoda, Palmer County Sheriff's Office Motorcycle Unit. I am also in charge of our direct supervision of three motorcycle deputies that are cross certified in the commercial vehicle enforcement unit. Uh, we have three in the north end, but we had to produce three in the south end. And the reason is that we discovered through the sheriff's office that we had a major problem with commercial motor vehicle uh, in, the, in the Delray Western area off of Lyons, Atlantic uh, area off of 441, and so on. Those, those involved actual like dump trucks, um, you know, semi trailers, uh, anything that's over a 10,000 pound weight limit. So you have a lot of landscaping businesses out west, plus the new construction going on on Lyons Road. Uh, always Clipmore, all the way up to Atlantic, 441. We were having problems with a lot of those dump trucks driving through there, causing a lot of issues with uh, vehicle traffic, such as dumping illegal weight or dumping a lot, a lot of uh, debris and stuff on the roadway. So as drivers on the road, you probably experience that, uh, you know, coming on top of your vehicle as you're driving behind them, or even on the roadway because they have uh, mechanical problems on their trucks. So as a sheriff's officer, we recognize that we're having a problem with this. So back in the summertime, as Captain Sands said, we initiated uh, sending three deputies over to uh, get trained in commercial motor vehicle uh, enforcement issues. We partnered up with uh, Florida Highway Patrol to get trained since they operate the uh, state uh, licensing issues. And we got certified in those, in those uh, problems. Uh, over se starting September area, they started their enforcement actions within the Western Delray area. Uh, during that time, until this current time, uh, we processed a lot of vehicles, inspect a lot of vehicles, and determined that we're having uh, huge issues uh, with these motor vehicles on the roadway. So lucky for you guys, this is hot off the presses, so you guys are the first ones to hear about these statistics. Uh, from September to today's date, there was a total of 81 inspections that had occurred from these deputies. Uh, 360 violations were observed on these, mo on these commercial motor vehicles. Uh, two drivers were actually placed out of service. Place out of service means that they weren't properly licensed or they had a uh, medical issue that they weren't supposed to be driving their commercial motor vehicle on the roadway. So that's a huge safety problem for everybody on the road if you have people that aren't licensed to drive those motor vehicles uh, on the roadway. Uh, 35 of these commercial motor vehicles were actually placed out of service due to mechanical problems or uh, other issues with their trucks that weren't supposed to be regulated on the roadway. So that was one of the things we observed is they weren't being regulated, they weren't being watched. So for us to pull them over and inspect them is a huge issue because now we can pull them off the road because they're unsafe. We pulled over a dump truck the other day, had 16 violations, four of them placed them out of service, which means that his brakes weren't even working properly, which means that's a, a huge safety issue for everybody on the roadway because he can't stop. So th that's what we're experiencing on the road. Uh, on top of that, the three deputies that are doing the commercial motor vehicles are also doing uh, motorcycle enforcement actions. So what they're doing is they're looking for speeders, they're doing school zone violations, and any other traffic violation they observe. So they have dual jobs. So they're really, really busy. Uh, anything past that, guys, please let me know. I'll be on the side. If you have any questions, ask me uh, after the meeting, and I'll answer anything you have. Happy holidays, everybody, and hopefully everybody has a good new year. Thank you, Captain. We have several, several guests who wish to speak. I'm going to call on uh, Vice Mayor Weinroth. Vice Mayor. Just voted. And for bigger and better things, I hope. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Happy holidays. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm now your new Vice Mayor. We take turns at being Mayor and Vice Mayor. We hand it around this year. Uh, Dave Kerner is our Mayor. And I am pleased to be in his second in command, a heartbeat away. Um, and working hand in hand, of course, with Mary Lou Berger, we are certainly a tag team down here as far as being your commissioners and anything you need between District 4 and 5 
It's my pleasure to help you, and certainly Commissioner Berger's staff is there to help you. I have a couple of things that I wanted to bring up today, and I guess keeping in, in, in line with the, uh, the motor vehicle issues that we've been talking about, uh, there is a new procedure. If you're like me, the last time you looked at a, uh, a motor vehicle manual was probably about 50 years ago. So we've uh, changed a little bit about the driving in Palm Beach County, which you probably should know. There is now a flashing yellow arrow. Yes. And you probably are wondering, what is a flashing yellow arrow? So when you come up to an intersection, which before had either a red arrow or a green arrow, red meaning you stopped, green meaning you were protected to make a left turn. Now, in some intersections, and right now this is being implemented in Boynton Beach along Congress, so you'll see them up there, but it will be implemented throughout the county. A flashing yellow arrow means it's an unprotected left turn. It's a permissive left, left turn, which means you come up to the intersection. If it is clear for you to make the left turn, you can make the left turn on a flashing yellow arrow. If it's red, you don't go. If it's green, you can go and you're protected from the oncoming traffic. If it's flashing yellow, you have to observe the traffic coming at you. If there is no traffic, you can then make the left turn. So this is a new procedure, and it's supposed to reduce accidents. It's also supposed to be a situation where you're not going to be stuck at a red arrow, and there's no traffic coming, and you're just frustrated. So if you see a flashing yellow arrow, that means it's a permissive left turn, and you can make the left, but make sure that there's no oncoming traffic. And, and one more thing, we've been having a lot of traffic accidents at the railroad crossings. And this is really something that shouldn't be happening. I mean, we had one terrible accident, which was at an uncontrolled uh, crossing, which I'm sure you heard about. A, a grandmother and two children were killed. But a lot of the accidents we've had are at crossings where the crossing arms have come down and for one reason or other people are just too too busy to wait. We had one very unfortunate incident about three weeks ago. A young man on a bicycle went through, got hit by the arm coming down, knocked him out, and he perished. He was hit by the, uh, the train. Please, please, please. It's not worth trying to beat out the, the, the arms to get across. Stop before the, uh, the tracks. If there's going to be traffic in front of you, don't get caught on the tracks. <coughs> Stop before the tracks. Be safe. Make it through the holidays. One last thing. We have a conference championship coming up at FAU this weekend. FAU is now the champions of the uh, con uh, Conference USA East, they're meeting UAB, that's going to be a game on Saturday right here in Boca Raton. So if you have some time, come on out to see the, uh, the Owls versus UAB at 1.30 at FAU. Have a great holiday. Thank you, Vice Mayor. And now I'm going to call on uh, our uh, Commissioner, Mary Lou Bergman. Mary Lou. <laughs> I can't say anything about it. We all know everything. <laughs> She's been here a long, long time. So have I. Got to think of it. Here you go, Mary Lou. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to see you all back after what was a... Uh, hot summer and then uh, unfortunately I couldn't be here for a couple of months because I was at various conferences um, learning how to be a better commissioner. Um, but right now I'm here with you and I'm happy to see all these uh, faces that I haven't seen for such a long time. And do we not have like a whole core of sheriff's people here and county people here? And uh, I really appreciate the fact that they take their time to come to the Alliance. 
So there's a lot of things going on right now, and uh, one of them is the airport. It's become very busy. It's the season now. And um, what is the phrase that those of us who live here year-round say? They're back. <laughs> um, let me see here. Also wanted to let you know, um, you know, a lot of you have guests that will come down over the next couple of months. And uh, Green Cane Nature Center up towards Boynton, how many of you have been there? Well, right now it's closed. So if you have some uh, visitors that are coming into town, not a good idea to go over to Green K um, because they are closed for some renovations. And I'll, we'll let you know when it reopens because I'm sure those renovations will make that an even better place to go and visit. And it really is beautiful. Um, we still have Wakotahatchee Wetlands. And I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that's also in the Boynton area and another good place to go. And there's always our beloved Murakami to go either as yourselves, as uh, people who have come back, or visitors that are coming in to see you over the next few months. So I don't want to take up a whole lot of time. I just wanted to mention those couple things because we have a long lineup of people that want to say good morning to you and, uh, and share some information with you. So I'm glad to see everybody here. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving, and I hope you have happy holidays, no matter how you, uh, how you spend them or which ones you celebrate. I hope that they're all wonderful, and a happy new year to everybody. Thank you. We have uh, Karen Bill from the school district. We're here today to school people today. We usually have none, but now we have two. Come on. In. Karen Bill, our commissioner on the board. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And good morning and greetings. First and foremost, I want to, from the entire school board, wish all of you a very happy, healthy holiday season and a happy and healthy new year. As I reflect back on the past year, one of the biggest challenges we have as school board members right now is getting our students and our parents to understand that when a student makes a threat to our schools, it's criminal. And so when the sheriffs go out to their homes, the parents say, well, they were only joking. Well, joke's over, guys, because we can't take any chances. We do not want to have the tragic events that have happened around the country and in our neighboring Parkland happen in Palm Beach County. So we are working now to create more videos, more home information to get families to understand. But then the other half of it is that when a student does get in trouble, it is very difficult these days to get families engaged in what's going on. You know, families are working two, three jobs. So this coming Wednesday, we are going to be talking about our expulsion policy. That's when we take students and put them in alternative settings. And we're going to require the families to now come in and sit and watch a video, learning their rights and learning what they need to do. And we're also going to make sure we have mental health people available for the families, for the students. So next year, look for us to be more focused on family engagement and a parental responsibility because we have to put these students in our schools to, on a positive track continuing forward. So to all of you, a happy and a healthy. Take care. Thank you. I uh, just want to uh, say hello to uh, a major collision, our former captain, Ken Payne the bit. We're glad to see you in Lori. Dr. Lori Vinegar, it's over and I get to sit down. Great, great. Thank you, President Bob. What a great job here. Today, we have organized, we've organized a terrific meeting here, which is going to be filled with information. We are going to have our Chief Reginald Duren come to speak, and he is our newer fire chief. I was really honored to be at his swearing-in ceremony where there were so many wonderful things spoken about him, and we have so much to look forward to with Chief Duran. Besides, his entire family is so involved in, in first responders and fire rescue. I met his wife, who actually is also a, a first responder. It, this is going to be a wonderful meeting. I'm handing the lectern over to our district chief, Anthony Tozzi, 
who will then introduce our speakers for the firefighters. And then the very vital information on Delray Medical Center's emergency services will follow. Chief Anthony Tozer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ben Good morning, everybody. Everybody have a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday, I hope. Yes. Good, good. Uh, thank you for having us. Um, you know, in the fire service, we have many fine traditions that we're all very proud of, and one of them is flying the flag from the ladder, and it's usually reserved for very special occasions. So, as you see when you walked in today, today is a special occasion, and us flying the flag is a tribute to you and your partnership. Thank you for your support over the years. It means a tremendous amount to us. I'd like to thank you. With that said, I'd also like to recognize Captain Tony Fazzo from Ladder 47, who is responsible, him and his crew, to set the flag up for you today. Thank you, Captain. Lieutenant Marcus from Rescue 245, and his crew are here today. Incidentally, when the meeting's over, they're going to have a static display. Please feel free to go out and look at all the equipment we carry, ask them some questions. They'd love to meet with you. Engine 41, Captain Ayala, you here? Thank you, Cap, for being here as well. And they're all under the command of one of my battalion chiefs, Chief Chris DeVito. Chief DeVito. Thank you for being here. So as Dr. Vinicor mentioned, um, we've got quite a few great speakers here today, and I'm going to introduce them to you. Um, we want to keep in the theme of this year's, uh, this year's theme, planning for the future, expansion, enhancements, and advances. And we like to think we're at the tip of the spear with all that at Fire Rescue. That's what we work towards. That's what we strive for. Um, we want to always do better. So with that said, I'd like to introduce uh, a tremendous mentor, our leader of our organization, our Fire Rescue Administrator, Chief Reginald Duran. Chief Duran. Good morning, Delray Alliance. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to speak and, and be a part of this fine example of what working together in cooperative environments between public and, all, and, and as well as your servants, um, how much better it can make, make us. So I want to thank you all for continually pushing us to be better and provide you the services that you certainly deserve. As the Fire Rescue Administrator, my priority is to continue to provide optimal services to you. There's no question about that. While at the same time remaining fiscally respons responsible and also holding the mic a little bit closer. <laughs> I know when many of you saw me walk in the room, probably your first question was, where's Doug McGlynn? Um, just, uh, Doug is away at training seminar. Um, those of you that know Doug know he's constantly training and improving and getting better. We certainly appreciate him for that. One of the priorities that we continue to have, you find this throughout the fire service, is response times, continually improving response times. Um, we're looking at three methods of doing that currently, one of them being traffic preemption. And we're looking at a couple of systems that allow us to access the light so they can turn green and allow us to proceed to your home or to your residence or to a business or whatever emergency may occur to get there quicker. That's one of the things we're looking at doing. The other thing we can do is add fire stations. And I know that's always going to be a hot topic. And we're in the process now of adding some new fire stations. Uh, probably the one you most likely to see soonest is the one White Feather and Military. Um, that station um, should be breaking ground sometime early in 2021. It's a very long process um, to go through permitting and planning and design and so on and so forth to make sure that we have the proper facility um, that can last, you know, we're looking at stations that should last 30, 40 years. Um, so we really got to plan in the future and get it right the very first time. Um, the other thing we can do is add personnel. Um, this commission has done a great job supporting fire rescue services. Um, Vice Mayor Weinroth and Commissioner Berger are avid, avid supporters of fire rescue getting additional personnel. And with that, over the course of approximately three years, we're going to add about 120 firefighters. Um, one of the first areas to see this change is right here, um, where we took the opportunity to add an additional medic um, to Station 44, which is a flavor picked in Hagen Ranch. We had an additional firefighter paramedic to Station 48. Was the High Luxo, just east of Lyons, and we added two firefighters to Station 52 at Pheasant Walk and in the Pheasant Walk neighborhood. Um, adding two firefighters allowed us to take which was an either-or station, which basically meant when the call came in, um, it was determined which vehicle was the best one to go in. If it was an EMS call, they would take the rescue, or a fire or the emergency, they would take the engine. 
well now both those units will be in service. And how that's impactful is now we have two units responding from that area and we have a great opportunity to have a unit in service whenever the call is requested. I kind of went over quickly about the addition, additional personnel to increase staffing in the other stations where we increase the staffing and rescue units. And why is that so vitally important? Well, I think one of the things we're going to learn in a little bit is just how demanding it is that if you have a significant event, um, when Chief Quell speaks, when you have a significant event, an advanced life support meeting event, you need significant bodies in order and staffing to effectively create the rescue. So by having three people on the rescue, that means that 90% of the time they can resolve those calls. It allows the engine to stay in service. It happens to be in that station as well. Again, building more redundancy in the system to make sure there's someone there when the call comes in. So we're very proud of that as well. Also in this budget, one of the things we've uh, allocated funding for or so ballistics equipment. So every seated position for every fire rescue personnel will have ballistics equipment in the event that we had an unfortunate event like an active shooter or other urgent event. A, a very exciting thing for us is that we moved from an ISO rated class three organization to a class two. Now, what's so significant about that is that puts us at about the top 5% of fire rescue organizations in terms of our capacity and our abilities from a fire perspective. Most fire organizations throughout the country are rated about a category five. Uh, South Florida is very rich with good departments, so probably five would be on the low end. But being a two, as large as we are, and of course striving to be number one, which is our goal, um, is very substantial for us. Uh, we have an initiative in place now, now, what we call it ISO Class 1 2022, because we can't apply for another two years, but it's our goal objective to become a Class 1 organization from a fire perspective. We're very excited about that. The other thing we're going to do is continue to place greater emphasis on community risk reduction. And what that's all about is really getting out, meeting with you, talking to you about everything from fall safety, um, accident and trip hazards throughout your home, to actually going through your homes and telling you how it can be safer from a fire perspective. It really means more community engagement. It means events like this where you come out and you interact with us and we help make your life better um, through teaching you ways you can be safer. So we're very excited about that. The other thing that I want to talk about is uh, Hurricane Dorian. And every time we have one of these unfortunate events, we as a fire department, we get better, we learn, we improve. I can tell you from this storm, we were absolutely prepared to meet the needs and potential demands of this community. Very excited. We also, after the event, did what we call a wash. When we did the hot wash, we talked about all the things we could have done better, areas where we can improve. And I'm going to ask that you do the same. You know, I, in my home, as a matter of fact, and there are some things I need to shore up. But, you know, when the season passes and time goes on, you just roll into the next season, you don't do that. I'm going to ask that you please, all those things that you realized when you thought Dorian was coming that you wish you had done, please take those protective actions now. It's never too early for you to be safe. So thank you for that. Um, additionally, um, Chief Tazi introduced me. I'm excited because I have the opportunity to promote someone within the organization to be a district chief. And I think he's doing an outstanding job representing us. And I certainly want to extend my appreciation to him, as well as the other great firefighters that are here, giving their all every day. Thank you to them. Um, I'm also very excited because I have the opportunity to promote Chief Coyle to a position of the EMS Division Chief, and he's going to be speaking to you shortly. It's exciting to promote Chief Coyle because, first of all, he's young, not old like myself, um, and he's going to have a bright future in this organization, and he brings an energy that you're going to clearly see and realize there's something different about Chief Coyle in a positive way. Um, also, Chief Dorita. Very excited about adding Chief Dorita to the staff. He brings a wealth of experience. He was a, a previous fire marshal in his last organization he was a part of. He brings to us a passion like none other in fire prevention. Really excited. He's going to help to make our communities even safer. With that, I want to say what an honor it is to be the fire chief. You know, I just said the other day, and I will always say this, in my organization, Palm Beach County Fire Rescue, um, every other job is the second best job because being the fire chief of this great organization, working with such great men and women, has made me so very proud. Perform means so much to me. Making this community safer, making it better, constantly improving is all I want to do for us. And I know we're going to come to a better community because of people like you coming out, making us get better, telling us what your needs are, voicing your opinions. I want you to know we value your input and thank you very much.
Thank you, Chief Durham, very much. Thank you for your leadership. Okay, as Chief mentioned, uh, we recently brought aboard uh, a friend, a colleague, and someone who I admire greatly, uh, who is one of the best fire marshals in the state of Florida. And I, I'm here to say we're blessed to have the two best fire marshals in the state of Florida recently join us. Chief David Woodside is our fire marshal. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here with us tonight, uh, but I look forward to introducing him in the future. Um, as Chief Durham mentioned, part of the team that he is building included Chief Dave Dorita. Chief Dave Dorita just finished a 30-year career with Palm Beach Gardens Fire Department where he was their fire marshal. Uh, he's written and enforced many of the fire codes that we work under. And it's my pleasure today to introduce to you our Assistant Fire Marshal of Palm Beach County Fire Rescue, Assist Assistant Fire Marshal Dave Dorita. Chief. Thank you. I stand out here because how do you follow that at five foot eight? So I was brought into the comedic relief. Um, so let me see how well I do. Um, I want to thank you guys for uh, having us. Uh, I do have a passion uh, for fire prevention. I did serve uh, time in operations and immediately found that it was a lot nicer, you know, writing up exit signs and bad fire extinguishers than going into the fire. So that's why you do that. But the passion becomes fire prevention. Uh, the, the word prevention. We're trying to put fire rescue and usually the uniform guys on the street hate us because we're trying to put them out of business. We want to reduce the fires. That reduces the ISO scores that the chief talked about. Um, it's a savings, but fire prevention now has morphed into community risk reduction and those are the big words that we want to use. And so fire prevention, we're known as the boss, Bureau of Safety Services. Uh, that's not an ego term, that's just a great acronym to use and, and people will pay attention to it, but we do everything from risk reduction. We have drowning prevention in the back. We have uh, brochures on CO detectors and that's one of the things I'm going to talk to you about because in reducing the amount of calls, we don't want our crews, the, the, the boots on the street, the ones that do all the work, we don't want them running the calls that they should never have been dispatched to in the first place. And it ties into the, the letter that's on your table. Um, CO monitors, not to be confused with CO2 that makes your soda sparkly, this is CO, it's an odorless, colorless gas that will basically, if you have a leak in your home and you don't have the proper detectors, you're going to go to sleep and never wake up. If you have the detectors, they go off and it's monitored or you call, fire rescue is going to respond and we're going to come into your home, business or residence and we're going to take meters and try to find where the source is coming from and hopefully get it repaired. It's usually a leaking gas valve or a stove that's burning improperly. But what we also have is a, the call volume has gone up tremendously on the golf carts. So does everyone know someone or someone here have a golf cart? Do we? Don't set me up for failure. Don't you? Okay, we have one. See, I brought the tchotchke gifts too. This is a carabiner, so when you repel this weekend, don't use it, it won't hold any weight. Who else has the golf cart? I saw a hand and then, well, you don't want the gift, you raised your hand. You know someone, you get the tchotchke key ring. There you go. It says CO is a, a deadly hazard. So hydrogen is what's setting off these CO detectors. Hydrogen is also an odorless, colorless gas. The difference between carbon monoxide and hydrogen, hydrogen, let's remember that historical moment in history, the Hindenburg, it's explosive. So we have this leaking gas in your house that will kill you just like CO can. The detectors will go off, so are the detectors faulty? The crews respond and they're coming in and we have fire reports and we write them and we go malfunction. It's not, it's not a faulty detector. CO detectors, do they sense CO? Yes or no? No. They sense a drop in oxygen. But even though you answered wrong, you had the guts to do it. You get a carabiner too. I've got a pocket full and I have to leave here empty. I actually took them from my guys over there so they're counting inventory. So it measures a drop in oxygen. So CO and hydrogen displace oxygen the same way. So the detector's working and fortunately it works in this case. And it's because we're charging golf carts in a garage. Golf carts are not like your car batteries. They're not maintenance free. You have to keep the level of, the level of water up. In them. If you overcharge them and they heat up, they produce hydrogen. Hydrogen will creep through cracks, crevices under the door. That's what's causing these alarms to go off. They're not malfunctioning. So improper charging. There's a letter on your table. It has a direct number to me. You can also email me. I'll give you the information you need. 
I could go on and on about this. That's that passion that they talked about, but I don't want to bore you with the detail. But it's a very serious hazard. So if you don't and you need more information, the back table has the brochures on carbon monoxide. If you have golf carts charging, we have a whole way that we can do it. We're going to put together a video for you that will be out uh, in a few months, hopefully, and then it'll tell you the proper way to charge. So that's one of the hazards. It's one of the ways we're moving forward to reduce risk reduction and hopefully have the responders. We're going to have calls. We're always going to have job security. Things will always go wrong, but we need them responding to the calls that they should be going to and not because of us not doing the right thing and prevent prevention. That's what we want to get across to you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief Dorita. Uh, Chief Dorita has many wonderful programs and he'd love to share them with you. So hopefully sometime in the near future we can have him come out and speak on some other fire safety uh, issues that will help us all. So as Chief Duran mentioned, uh, we're also very blessed to have a new Chief of our Emergency Medical Services. You know, with any organization, there's always that one individual that has the wow factor. You know, he's a, he or she is a leader just right from the beginning, and you know they're, they're going to be doing big things for you or your organization. And we've been blessed over the last decade to have a leader in our emergency medical services within Fire Rescue prior to him becoming chief, and that was Chief Charlie Coyle. So with that, I'd like to take the pleasure to introduce a friend, a colleague, and our wow factor at Palm Beach County Fire Rescue, our new chief of medical service division, Division Chief Charlie Coyle. How do I live up to all of this hype about me and energy and motivation and all that stuff? Well, I'm going to try and do my best, but what I was asked to talk about with you folks today is the innovation that we're doing in the EMS perspective and how we integrate that with the local hospital. So I took a little time to, to read about the Delray Alliance, and I love to read your mission statement because it spoke specifically about EMS. So I'm already internally committed to your organization because you talk our language that we love to talk about in the public setting. So let's go ahead and get started. Two things that we're going to talk about today. Innovation in stroke care and then innovation in cardiac arrest care. And I think it's going to set Dr. Lieberman up just perfect to review a case study with you at the conclusion of my talk. So let's dive right into stroke and figure out why stroke is so important and why do you need to contact 911 right away. Well, there's been some quantif uh, quantifiable time to say what actually happens when you have a stroke and what your symptoms could turn out to be and what disability it leads to. So let's look at this. Every minute that goes by that you have a large vessel occlusion stroke, and please allow me to explain this to you in the next couple slides, I'm going to simplify it. It's not a medical term, but I'm going to say it's a tree trunk stroke, and that'll make sense to you here in a minute. But what you do is you lose 1.9 million neurons. Now remember, your brain is like an electrical box, and it sends signal to signal. But when you lose neurons, you lose the capability to transmit that signal. So just think about that. Every minute that goes by, 1.9 million neurons. For every hour that goes by that it's not treated, you lose 3.6 years your, I'm sorry, your brain ages 3.6 years during that time. Stroke remains the leading cause of serious long-term disability in adults. So I put this picture of the tree up here. And the reason why I show you the tree and the reason why I say a tree trunk stroke is because this tree is very similar to your brain. And the reason I say that is because, remember, anything above here starts the blood flow to your brain. So your heart's responsible for pumping the blood to perfuse your brain. So anything that goes up into your brain starts at these big vessels that come up here and branch off, much like a tree does. As it comes up, it goes off into the big feeder vessels that feed your brain. And if you don't believe me, here's an actual angiogram of what the human anatomy looks like. Here's the tree trunk, and then it goes off into these little feeder vessels, and this is the end product of what it looks like. So the large majority of the strokes that we run in the community are something called ischemic strokes, and approximately 15% of them come from the large vessels, the tree trunk strokes. So basically, if you could think of plumbing, or you think about a pipe, this pipe has a complete occlusion in it, and about 15 years ago, 
they would give you a medication, everybody would huddle around, and they would really pray for you and hope that you had a good, successful outcome. The game has vastly changed over the past couple of years. And what I mean by that is this little procedure here, they go in through your groin, they find that goes all the way up, they have, use a catheter that goes all the way up to your brain, and what Dr. Malik likes to explain it as, it's like driving a remote control car through the city of New York while you're standing in San Francisco. <laughs> but what they do is they poke through this clot, this occlusion, they provide a drink of blood to your brain, and then they remove it out. It's like rotor rotor They pull it right out, and it comes right out of your body. I actually brought some cases to demonstrate to you exactly what this looks like. And the reason why I show you the cases is because there's a parallel system that's in place. Palm Beach County Fire Rescue, the neural interventionalists at Delray Hospital have created a system where we talk throughout your stroke as we're transporting you to the hospital to let them know your progress and let them be prepared to immediately lower that catheterization time. And if you don't believe me, I have some numbers here to show you. And if you can see this clot right here, this is after the clot was removed. So this is the tree trunk stroke. This is after it's done. Procedure was done in 68 minutes. Again, tree trunk stroke, reperfusion. Here's what came out, 53 minutes, 42 minutes. If you notice a trend here, the time is just clicking away and we're getting much more sophisticated in the community and in the hospital working as a team. This is my favorite case because this was November 22nd. This was actually just recently. This patient actually went home to spend Thanksgiving with their family. But look at this, patient discharge, discharge from the hospital in 24 hours. I can't even get my dry cleaning done in 24 hours. <laughs> Complete tree trunk sto stroke, clot removed, patient revascularized, home in 24 hours. This is the neural interventionist that works in this community. His name is Dr. Niels Mueller, and this was him Wednesday. And this is our studio. We're so blessed to have an actual video studio at Palm Beach County Fire Rescue. And he comes in about every couple months to re-educate our folks to make sure that they understand what the signs and symptoms look like and how we can better improve our stroke system. So it, since I have the opportunity to speak to the, to the folks here, I would like to just reiterate to you the importance of recognizing stroke because even though it's the leading cause of disability in the community, we still on an average take up to three hours to call 911 when we suffer stroke-like symptoms. So I'm gonna give you some atypical stroke signs that are a little bit out of the ordinary. Number one, one-sided weakness of your body, your face, do not hesitate, call 911. Number two, any loss of vision or disruption of vision, call 911. Any loss of normal speech, any loss of sensation, or any loss of balance or coordination. That could be a posterior stroke in the back of your head, and these are not typical signs of a stroke that we like to push off and just say, oh, I'm not feeling well today. If you have that large vessel occlusion, that tree trunk stroke, just remember that you're losing neurons by the minute by not calling 911. Uh, bleeding stroke, it's going to be the worst headache of your life. It's very hard for us to differentiate, but just know that your local hospital also treats the hemorrhagic stroke when the vessel actually ruptures. The mnemonic that the American Heart Association uses is fast, facial droop, arm weakness, speech difficulty. Please call 911. Do not hesitate. That's what we're here for. So let me shift gears a little bit and talk about cardiac arrest. And I'm going to start back in 2011. And I'm just going to kind of give you a little trend where we started and where we're going. Uh, and hopefully uh, we end up off the charts because we're getting there slowly. But in 2011, you can see this was how many patients in the state of Florida we were able to successfully, successfully rest, resuscitate from an EMS perspective. And it was less than 6%, or right at 6%. 2013, we got a jump. The guidelines changed. We went to 16%. 2014, we were at 17% in the state. Palm Beach County Fire Rescue hovered right between the 16 and 20% mark. However, I love to use this quote when I talk about cardiac arrest, or I talk about stroke, or I talk about innovative theories. Insanity was labeled by Albert Einstein as doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results. So if I show you those statistics, and you look and the line just keeps going like this, well, don't you think we should probably change something in cardiac arrest care? Is 16% something that we should say, wow, we're doing a good job? The answer to that is absolutely not. 
The chain of survival is something that was coined in the early 80s in a newsletter in Orlando, but actually made it to publication in 1989. And there's five things that stay true today that we said in 2015, man, we really need to check out our system and make sure we're doing the right thing. Number one, recognition and activation of the emergency response team. That's largely done through our boss department because we reach out to people in the communities and provide service and provide hands-only CPR. And we teach the citizens that you need to be able to understand that if a patient has these symptoms or the patient is unresponsive, the first thing you need to do before trying to help them is call us to get the wheels turning. Number two is we looked at the immediate high-quality CPR. Well, who do you think is the first responder? Who do you think is the first person that's on the scene of that cardiac arrest? Anybody shout it out. We are. We are. We are. You are. So how do we get to you? If we haven't come to, do, to your uh, community to do CPR, how do we get to you? Phone. By phone. So we looked at our call dispatch center, and we said, what's the average time in 2014 of our dispatchers initiating CPR through the phone? We measured that time. Anyone want to take a shot at what that time was in 2014? I wish. Four, four minutes and 15 seconds is where we were. So we said, hey, how do we get better with this? So we took the cards that we have to use and we just rip them up and threw them in the trash can and said, let's, let's rework these things. And we did. Now the average, the average goal that you want to achieve is two minutes and guess where we're at? A minute and 27 seconds. And that's not me. No, 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 no. Thank you for the applause, but I wish my dispatching folks were here because I gotta tell you, they have a quality improvement system in-house there and let me tell you, she's like the warden. When she comes out, if you're over two minutes, you better have a good explanation. So that's number two. Number three, rapid defibrillation. Is there an AED anywhere in this building? Can anyone tell me? Outside where? I think in the office. I got you, bro. There you go. Okay, so it's not in the office. If you actually go outside, it's right here to the right. But what I will challenge you to do is next time you're in the community, whether it be Publix, whether it be the movie theater, wherever you're at, look for the AED. Timely defibrillation saves lives, okay? And our crews know this. And what I'm gonna tell you about the next bullet here is the basic advanced emergency medical services. We work on something called pit crew CPR, where all of our crew members know a specific task and job. And when we respond to a cardiac arrest, it's almost like we're SEAL Team 6. Everybody breaks off, everybody knows what they're supposed to do, and they implement it flawlessly because they practice it until they can't get it wrong. And then the last one is advanced life support of post-arrest care. And I'm going to leave this to Dr. Lieberman to expand on a little bit, but I will tell you this, that I'm very excited as a community. We've now got all of the hospitals together with Fire Rescue, and we established something called the Cardiac Care Collaborative, where we all get together and share best practices. And it's not just Palm Beach County Fire Rescue, it's any service in the community, such as Boca, Delray, all these other municipality fire departments, they come to our meeting as well too to make sure that we're all doing the right thing. So what changed after 2015? Well, these are all cardiac arrest survivors. And I could go on and on and tell you about each one of them, but I'm not gonna because I gotta be respectful of the time here. But I wanna talk to you about two cases. Number one, this little girl right here. That's baby Stella. Baby Stella, when she was 10 months old, was in the pool for six minutes. Crews came in. Dispatch did their job with CPR. We took her to the back of the truck. We stayed on scene for 20 minutes. Crews got a pulse back. And yesterday, or two days ago, I received a video. Baby Stella at three years old took her first steps. Uh, she is 100% neuro intact, survived, and is at home. But I want to share one more case with you, and I promise I'll turn the mic over at this time. I have a lot of chiefs here, so I've got to be cautious on the way I say this. So I'll just, uh, I'll try and preface it appropriately. What you see here is a picture from a third floor, from a third floor hospital room. And this crew is doing training uh, at the local hospital. So what they have here is one of our ladder trucks. The ladder's raised to the third floor. The picture's taken in the hospital room looking out at the crew. And what it says here is, get well, Chase. This young man right here, 31 years old, Palm Beach County Fire Rescue employee for six years, firefighter paramedic, went into cardiac arrest at 4.45 in the morning. Oh my God. Right next to him, his beautiful wife, 31 years old as well, 11 weeks pregnant, called 911 immediately. 
Dispatch coached her on how to do CPR. Within 45 seconds, she was doing CPR. Crews arrived, SEAL Team 6 came in, everybody set up. Remember I said defibrillation, timely defibrillation if applicable. Chase received four defibrillations. Chase was transported to the local hospital. Chase was put into a comatose state for four days under cooling or three days under cooling. Chase now is home and went to his son's soccer game this Saturday. So enough with the emotions, let's get back to the facts. And here they are. Remember, I gave you these slides earlier, 6%, 16, 17, 16. After changing the system in 2015, we jumped to 40%. There has been times throughout the year of 2018 where we were into the 56 percentile with 12% of those patients returning 100% neurointact home to their loved ones. Thank you so much for your time. We are really getting some vital information here today. And our chief here is going to be switching over for our Delroy Medical Center presentation. We have Dr. Eric Lieberman. He's a cardiologist specializing in preventive <coughs> cardiology, peripheral arterial disease, echocardiography, nuclear cardiology, pacemaker evaluation, and transesophageal echocardiography. Dr. Lieberman's focus is to educate his patients in the fundamentals of preventive care. He is committed to effectively communicate with his patients and provide the excellent care necessary to help patients with issues which can include diabetes and high blood pressure. Dr. Lieberman is on staff at Delray Medical Center and has been practicing medicine for over 25 years. Very well qualified to explain to us all about our emergency services what our community hospital does for us. Dr. Eric Levy. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. It's great to be here, and to be here with EMS. Uh, happy holidays. It's that time of year for me. It's all about college football season. And what that means today is it's all about being a team sport, and this is the ultimate team sport. But the winner is the patients, and we get really the gratitude of being able to take care of patients in a collaborative manner. So working with our EMS colleagues, working with my colleagues in the ER, working with the nursing and support staff at the hospital makes all of this possible. So let me talk a little bit about coronary artery disease, how we got here, and then we'll talk a little bit about carrying on what EMS does in the field. So the same issue that was talked about with stroke is true of heart disease. Time is muscle. The quicker we get to you when you start experiencing a heart attack, the quicker we save muscle. When heart muscle is damaged, it does not come back. There is no regeneration of heart muscle. You damage the liver, the liver comes back. The heart does not come back. So minutes matter. The quicker you identify symptoms, the quicker you get to us, the quicker we open the artery. And we taught the neurologist how to open the arteries. Uh, we were doing it in the heart about 15 to 20 years ago. We can save lives. We can save muscle. And that's what we're trying to do. If you, take, if you want to look at the typical symptoms associated with heart disease, first of all, remember that men and women will experience symptoms differently. The classic symptom is chest discomfort. I am very careful to say to patients, do you have any chest discomfort or any sensation? Not pain. Very few patients will describe it as a pain. It is more likely a pressure, an achiness, a burning. It may go to either arm, or classically the left arm, but it can go to the right arm. In women, the symptoms may be more difficult to elicit. It may be more indigestion. It may be o overly fatigued. So when you notice a change in symptoms, when you feel different, it needs to get checked out, particularly if it's an abrupt change. If we take a look at the risk of heart disease, it's significant. Heart disease remains the leading cause of death in the United States, both in men and women. While we certainly need to worry about oncologic situations, about cancer, about infectious disease, about the flu, about everything else, we can't minimize the role of cardiovascular disease in impacting our overall lifespan. Yet we've had tremendous impact on this. We're talking about what to do acutely today, how to deal with stroke, how to deal with heart attack to prevent the mortality, to prevent the death associated with that acute event. But if I could make one plea, and it comes from my initial introduction, 
And it comes back to everything the fire department talked about. Prevention is everything. You heard about it from the fire marshal. I'm going to tell you the same thing as a cardiologist. My passion is to never see you in the emergency room. My passion is to lower your cholesterol, to get your diabetes under control, to control your blood pressure. Because taking all of these medications or modifying your lifestyle will reduce your risk significantly. I get pushed back every day in the office. I don't want to be on meds. I don't want to do this. Well, why is it we have extended longevity in this country over the last 15 to 20 years? It's because we've learned how to effectively treat diabetes, effectively treat blood pressure, and effectively treat cholesterol. With a combination of once-a-day medications, we can reduce overall mortality from cardiovascular disease by excess of 80%. What do you do on a daily basis that makes you 80% more likely to be alive? Take care of yourself, get appropriate treatment, deal with things preventively. Well, let's go back to the acute situation. This is difficult for me to explain to physicians, nurses, as well as all of you, but it's an incredibly important concept. So I'm going to take a few minutes to go through this. Bullet point number one says it all. 84% of all heart attacks are caused by blockages that are less than 70% in severity. Let me tell you what that means. You have your stress test today and it's normal, you could still have a heart attack tomorrow. You have an angiogram. We take you to the cath lab at Delray Medical Center. We do the best test known to man to identify blockages. Normal. You can have a heart attack tomorrow. Because it's not the severe blockage that causes a heart attack. It's not the 80 and 90 percent blockage. It's a relatively minor plaque or 10 or 20 percent blockage that abruptly rips open, a clot forms, and that causes a heart attack. You're going to have no warning sign until it happens, and then the event is going to occur abruptly. Putting a stent in ahead of time is not going to prevent it, because it didn't come from a 70% blockage. We stent 70% and greater blockages. We bypass 70% and greater blockages. We don't bypass a 20% blockage. You may have heard about a study that came out of the American Heart Association just recently talking about the role of bypass surgery or stents versus medical therapy for patients with heart disease. They all work equally well. Because the heart attack that occurs is not from the one we're stenting or bypassing. Now, I'm not trying to put my interventional colleagues or surgeons out of business. There's a role for bypass surgery. There's a role for stents. It alleviates symptoms of angina, symptoms of chest discomfort, which occur with exertion. But it does not prevent heart attacks. You want to prevent a heart attack? Lower cholesterol, get diabetes under control, control your blood pressure, exercise on a regular basis. 50% of patients with a heart attack will have no history of heart disease. This is going to be their initial manifestation. So they've never been known to have heart disease, they don't see a cardiologist, maybe they don't see a physician at all. Their first manifestation is going to be discomfort in the chest, going down the left arm, they're having a heart attack. And 50% of those patients are going to die before they make it to the hospital. Now you've seen Due to the work of EMS and community education, we're getting better. But overall national statistics remain 50% are going to pass in the field before anyone gets to them, even before EMS can necessarily intervene. So time is muscle. Getting treatment immediately is critical to survival. I'm oh, sorry. So I'm not going to belabor this point because it's been well it's been well documented and, and discussed this morning, but I started this by saying this is the ultimate team sport. I do not take care of a patient in isolation. I take care of a patient in collaboration with a number of people, primarily the patient. We're a team. If we don't work together on solving a problem, it's not going to get solved. I see you for 15 minutes in the office, I give you advice, you then spend the other 23 hours and 45 minutes figuring out what to do during the day. So we need to work as a team. In the acute situation, you get to us only because fire rescue did their job. Because they got out there, they did the resuscitation, they initiated the urgent therapy. The difference between my team and a football team is I don't get to see my colleagues every day. But I get to see what they do every day. Because they get the patient to the ER, the ER takes over, they're long gone on to their next run, and I'm walking in to see the patient. And the only reason I'm there, because they did it, they accomplished what needed to be accomplished in the field. Then the ER docs take over. Communication is going all along. So as soon as EMS identifies what's going on, just as with the stroke patient, there's communication to the ER. If you're around Delray Medical Center, you're going to hear cardiac alert throughout the day. 
That means somebody in the field has told our ER that we got a patient who's arriving at the hospital potentially with a heart attack. What does that mean? We're getting ready. We're opening up the cath lab. We're preparing our staff. We are ready to roll. We're not waiting until you hit the door to get things moving. Things are in place even before you get in that front door of the hospital. So if you take a look at the number of cardiac alerts shown in blue, you can see over the last year or so where we're at. Most of those, look at the red line, most of those come from EMS. So our EMS colleagues are the ones getting you there and getting you there quickly. And then from there, a number of them go to the cath lab. Now some don't go to the cath lab either because it wasn't a heart attack, patient's not appropriate to go to the cath lab for other reasons or other issues going on, it's a different diagnosis. But the reality is we're getting you to the cath lab because the cath lab is where we do the procedures as was discussed with stroke where we open up the blockages. So time is muscle. And what we're really trying to do is shorten that time. We're trying to get down to as short a period of time from the time you hit the front door until we get a balloon across the artery. Because when we get a balloon across that blockage, we've restored blood supply. So our numbers are tremendous, and it's really a testament to everybody working together. What happens in the field, what happens in the ER, what happens in our cath lab, our nursing and physician staff. Um, I'll skip some of this and really kind of bring it home. You know, it's interesting that we both wanted to talk about case studies. So, oh, sorry, you go all the way to the end. Apologize for that. Okay, I'm going to put this down so I don't mess with it. I want to talk about a patient I know. Um, Don is an amazing 74-year-old guy who I knew for a number of years before this. And one morning, around 4 in the morning, my phone went off. I was on call that night, and Don was in the emergency room. He'd had a cardiac arrest at home. His wife identified the cardiac arrest. She called their security team at where they live, and EMS was activated as well. CPR was started immediately by the security team, and an EMS came out, fire engine, uh, fire rescue engine 45, rescue 45, and EMS 42 arrived with the defibrillator and performed defibrillation on the scene. So the patient was defibrillated, as you heard about, on spot, while already receiving CPR. So CPR is initiated, basically, to put it bluntly, Don's dead at this point. There is no heart rhythm. He's getting CPR, he's getting defibrillated. He was brought to Delray, and shortly thereafter, we were called, he was brought to the cath lab. He had a blockage involving one of his arteries, which was opened up by my colleague, Dr. Fisher. We had extensive conversations with his amazing wife and son, who happens to be a surgeon. And we also talked about initiating what we call the hypothermia protocol. So basically, we cooled Don down for 24 hours. This has been shown to preserve brain function, to improve neurologic recovery. Because the problem is he had about eight minutes of downtime. So that the brain's not getting blood for eight minutes there. And the question is, we can get the heart back, but what does that mean if neurologically you're not intact? It's all about being neurologically intact. So we cooled on for 24 hours and then started rewarming. And rewarming takes about 12 to 24 hours. And one afternoon, I think, um, it was about a day later, I got a call from Dr. Fisher who had actually done his procedure and said, you got to get over to Del right now. I go, what's going on, Mark? I'm in the office. What do you need? you got to come talk to Don. I go, what do you mean talk to Don? He goes, he's fine. So I think the best way for me to let you know about Don is to introduce Don. So Don, you want to come on up? I want to tell you that Don became my patient because he had a lot to do with the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest. I'll let him tell you. That. <laughs> All right, my friend and my patient, Dr. Thank you. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, and for me, you can imagine, it really is a pleasure to be here. No question about it. Um, you know, I, I looked up, in, in preparation for this morning, I looked up more information than I could find on cardiac arrest. 600,000 people have a cardiac arrest every year. 94% of them die if it's outside of the hospital. If you're in a hospital, you have a better chance, but outside the hospital. And clearly, it was the, we've heard it several times this morning, it was the fact that my wife was smart enough, quick enough to move and get the right people there at the right time. But let me tell you a little bit about this. Because we learned and heard an expression that you don't ever do anything at home you don't want to have to explain to the paramedic when he comes. <laughs> 
So on the night of September 16th, 2007, 2017, we have a lot to explain. Uh, earlier in the evening, I had taken part uh, in, in uh, Parkinson medication. And uh, we have marijuana for Parkinson's, medical marijuana. And we did, uh, I did, my only it, I took some puffs of marijuana. And we got into bed and started to engage in loving. Now, at 76, with two shoulder replacements, two knee replacements, cataract surgery, <laughs> prostate cancer, uh, melanoma, and probably several other things you don't even know about. It's still love in my house. And we can still keep going. <laughs> A few minutes into the activities, my wife said to me, Don, you're heavy. Get up. Get up. You're like dead weight. Well, of course I was like dead weight. I was dead. <laughs> she had the presence of mind to slowly push me off the bed, get out from under me. As I hit the floor, my eyes rolled back in my head, and I wasn't breathing. Now, a lot of people would have just started screaming and running around the house trying to figure out what to do. Not my wonderful wife. She's a bright lady. She keeps her cool. She knows what to do. And she immediately called, we live in Addison, Missouri. She immediately called the uh, Addison, Missouri uh, security. We're very fortunate there that we have a revolving, a revolving, a ro roving EMS squad 24 7. They were at my house in two minutes. Brown, the men, they came to see me. And she suddenly realized she's standing there with the paramedics and she's stark naked. Oh. But she handled it. She had <laughs> um, The paramedics immediately began to work on me. And CPR was obviously the first thing they did. And Brown kept saying, is he okay, is he okay? And the guy said, I can't get a breath, I can't get a heartbeat. He said, well, we still have a bring out the defibrillator. So they took out the defibrillator and, and shot me, three, shocked, shocked me three times. And on the third time, I came back and started breathing. I was rushed to Delray Hospital. Uh, Dr. Lieberman was there. They did what, they, what he was talking about. The, the ice bath, uh, I was given an ice bath, I put an ice bath, I was put in a coma. And uh, at that point it was in Dr. Lieberman's and Dr. Fisher's hands and uh, God I'm sure was there too, watching over me. It was an incredible time and miraculously I survived. Because as he just, I didn't hear it, just now I realized I was dead for eight minutes. Dead for eight minutes without any brain damage is unbelievable. No physical brain damage, no, no neuro, neuro, neurological. That's some of the Parkinson's. What you're hearing now is a little bit of the Parkinson's. Okay? But even with the Parkinson's, I've been blessed to the point that I have lived a normal life. We travel all over the world. It's been a wonderful time with my children, my grandchildren. Um, but it, it, it's people like him. It's people like Dr. Liebman who care and are dedicated. He's the most dedicated doctor I know. He has kept me alive. And he's promised to keep me alive. He's guaranteed me to keep me alive <laughs> several more years. Several more years to make it work. But you're learning a lot here today. And what you heard about is quick intervention is critical. Keeping your cool. If any of you have the experience of having yourself or having anyone else do it, uh, keeping your cool is critical and taking care of yourself. I exercise every day. That's a lie. I exercise six days a week. I had cardiac re rehab. Fortunately, there was no damage to my heart. And life has gone on, and life is beautiful. Uh, yeah, I want to tell you something. The EMS guys, uh, and the sheriff's office, and the police, never get, let me just get this. Never get the, the thanks and the news. I'm sort of taking it for granted. We take, we see a fire truck go by, we go, oh, someone's in trouble. It's not me, so we take it for granted. But we can't take these guys for granted. We have to pay attention and respect them and honor them every chance we get. So in case I haven't, I'd like to just finish up by saying, in case you haven't felt, this is, this is to the firemen and the well, all, all the professional personnel, in case you haven't felt it today, you are appreciated. In case you wanted to quit today, don't. You're needed. In case you need to talk, but feel no one will listen. 
but there are many who will. In case you haven't heard it today, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. And thank you, Dr. Lieberman. Thank you, Dr. Lieberman. Wonderful, wonderful. What a terrific program we had today. Really fantastic. Give everybody a round of applause. Our fire chief is still here. Thank you so much to the firefighters and to our uh, PBSO, to Sheriff and all. And this is the end of the program. But just to let you all repeat it again, that remember our Get to Know Palm Beach County Expo, bring the cards back to your associations and, and let people know about that. And remember our Wellness Screening Expo, and that's very appropriate to end with that today, that we're going to have with Delray Medical Center. We partner every year, Friday, January 31st, 8 a.m. to noon, and there would be blood screenings and all, so look for those flyers and all in the following newsletters. Have a terrific holiday, and we'll see you in the first week of January. One minute. One minute.